for the first time ever on 60 Days In. We're going in. As a united front. You're open. We signed up for this. Would you? 60 Days In, new season premieres tonight at 9. Part of the Pursuit, a crime and investigation event only on A&E. My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. We are getting closer to Halloween, which is my favorite holiday of the year. Why? Well, it's the only time of the year that it's okay to eat boxes of tiny candy bars. There's no stress like on Christmas or Valentine's Day, and the best thing is, you can dress however you wish and likely not get arrested. Just like we did last year, Horrifying History wants to give you all a gift for this Halloween, and what better gift is there than an additional episode? This year, we're collaborating with another great show on the DarkCast Network. Beyond the Rainbow is an amazing show that brings you the crimes committed by or against the LGBTQ community. Host CJ tells you not just the stories that you would normally hear, but the lesser-known tales that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Today will be no different when we both tell you about horrifying crimes that occurred on Halloween. Welcome to our Halloween crossover episode, and happy Halloween from us to you all. At nearly 11 p.m. on Halloween night in 1957, 35-year-old Peter Fabiano was more than a little perturbed when a late trick-or-treater rang his doorbell, not just once, but twice. The doorbell woke both he and his 39-year-old wife, Betty. Grumbling to himself all the way downstairs, he grabbed the candy dish, flung the front door open with the question, It's a little late for this, isn't it? He immediately saw it wasn't a child. He didn't recognize the woman that stood in front of him. She was dressed in jeans, a khaki jacket, red gloves, and a black mask that only covered around her eyes. She replied to his question in a deep voice, No, as she reached into the paper bag she carried and she pulled out a thirty-eight revolver. She shot Peter dead and she ran back to the car parked in front of his home. She got inside the passenger seat, and she was met with a kiss and a whispered, Thank you. From the driver, a woman named Joan Rabel. The killer was 43-year-old Goldie Pizer, and she was doing a huge favor for 40-year-old Joan. The two women sped away from the Fabiano home. They found a remote area to burn their clothes and to put some fresh new clothing on. Then they returned the car they borrowed to their friend. When their errands were completed, Joan turned to Goldie and said, Forget you ever knew me. And the two women parted ways. The following day, Goldie didn't know what to do with the gun. Joan had never told her what she should do with it. So Goldie took it to downtown Los Angeles, and she found a locker at a department store. She opened up an empty one, and she dumped the gun inside the locker. No lock just kind of threw it in and shut the locker door. Back at the Fabiano home, the sound of the gunshot sent both wife Betty and daughter Judy running downstairs. Downstairs is where they found Peter in a pool of his own blood. Judy then ran to a neighbor's home. This neighbor was a police officer. He tried to calm the teenage girl and he called his precinct to send some officers out. An ambulance also arrived and transported Peter to the nearest hospital. This is where Peter would die of the wound to his chest. 
Peter Fabiano was a successful hairstylist in the Los Angeles area. The family was pretty well off, owning two salons. Nothing was taken from his home, and there was not a shell casing found. Police started to think that this must be a gang or a mob hit. Fabiano, a good Italian name. But Peter had no ties to either, so that theory was dismissed rather quickly. There was a 15-year-old boy standing around the neighborhood that night. He was the only one to witness the shooting and the suspects fleeing in a car. After that information, he proved not to be very useful, because his details were murky at best. Friends, relatives, and neighbors were all interviewed, but no one offered any reason for Peter to be murdered. Betty remained sedated for several days before allowing herself to be interviewed by detectives or media. She told the police she heard two voices that night, a man's voice other than Peter's, and another man's voice pretending to be a woman's. Police asked if Peter had any enemies, and Betty surprisingly named her good friend Joan Rabel. Joan Rabel. Joan Rabel had entered one of the Fabiano salons looking for work earlier that year. Prior to that, Joan had been traveling the world as a writer and photographer. At that time, she had been married, but she was recently divorced. Now, she was independent, but out of funds for a while and seeking work. When she entered the Fabiano salon, she was hired. Her and Betty became fast friends. Peter was Betty's second husband, and at times things were tumultuous between the couple. When times got tough for Peter and Betty's relationship, Betty found herself at Joan's apartment seeking comfort and refuge. This didn't make Peter very happy. After one particularly bad fight that Betty and Peter had, Betty actually moved in with Joan. Peter was very threatened by how close the two women were and he knew that Betty would confide all of their secrets to Joan. Eventually, Betty decided that she wanted to rekindle things with Peter, and she moved back with him. She also confessed to him that she had a lesbian relationship with Joan. But Peter took her back anyway, as long as Betty promised not to see Joan again. And I think the oddest thing to me here is, after Betty and Joan's tryst, Joan didn't lose her employment at the salon. Within a few months, Joan would meet Goldie Pizer. Goldie was born Goldine of German descent, and she was a medical secretary. Goldie had been married to a man before as well. He sadly had passed away, and she was now a widow. Joan and Goldie would spend time together drinking coffee at cute little coffee shops and gossiping. During these coffee breaks, Joan would tell Goldie all about the evil Peter Fabiano, her employer, and what a horrible, horrible man he was. It was obvious that Joan was harboring tons of resentment for Peter, and that was because Betty chose him over her. Joan was crushed, and she wanted revenge on Peter. In Joan's mind, if she had Peter killed... Betty would come running back to her arms. That was her hope, anyway. It didn't take long for Joan to start seducing Goldie, much as she did Betty. Goldie, however, Joan had no real feelings for. Goldie was simply a pawn to do Joan's dirty work. But for Goldie, she was smitten with Joan, and she fell for every sweet word Joan would romance her with. A month before the murder of Peter, Goldie and Joan went to Pasadena to buy the 38 caliber revolver. Goldie told the shop operator it was for self-protection. Joan then paid for the gun, and Goldie, well, she held on to it until Halloween night. When Betty told police Joan was someone who hated Peter, police went to Joan and questioned her, but they didn't really have enough to hold her. Two weeks after Peter's murder, a gun was found in a downtown department store locker. The gun was traced and registered to a woman named Goldine Pizer. It became pretty clear Goldie wasn't in the business of killing people. 
The gun was registered in her name, so it was kind of dumb to just throw it in a downtown locker and hope for the best. Police found Goldie at her home in Hollywood, and they brought her down to the station. She was questioned and arrested for Peter's murder. Goldie confessed and told detectives she'd been coerced by Joan Rabel. Joan had told her that Peter was an evil, vile man who physically abused his wife and sold narcotics. After her inquisition, Goldie took a sigh of relief, and she told detectives she was happy to get everything off of her chest because it was really, really weighing on her. Joan was again approached by the police, and this time with Goldie's allegations, Joan was arrested. The two women went to trial where Goldie tried to plead not guilty by reasons of insanity. She claimed Joan had put her under a spell of sorts and charmed her into killing Peter for her. She knew not what she did on Halloween when she was at the Fabiano house. She had wanted to say she was obsessed, infatuated, and even in love with Joan, and that's why she murdered for her. But it was 1957, and lesbian love was a definite no-no. In court, both women had completely different demeanors. Goldie was weepy and remorseful. Joan was relaxed, confident, almost good-humored which is such odd behavior for someone facing a trial for second-degree murder. Both women finally made a plea of guilty. Joan continued to wear her odd smile throughout the trial, while Goldie would break into tears repeatedly. In the end, both women were found guilty of second-degree murder, but they were only sentenced to five years each. Betty would sell both beauty salons, and then she'd go on to remarry in 1966. She passed away in Palm Springs in 1999. It's been speculated that Betty encouraged Joan to murder her husband, Peter. But the truth to that died with Betty in 1999. Goldie served out her time, and when she was released, she remained in the Los Angeles area. She died at the age of 83 in 1998. Not much is known about Joan Rabel. It's assumed she was released near the same time as Goldie. And after her release, she just kind of blended in with the world. I did see a very sparse obituary for Joan Rabel. It said a Joan Rabel died in Los Angeles in 2012. I think that could have been her but there was no age or any detail to confirm it was the Joan of this story. I was inspired to dig a little deeper into a more historic case this episode by my friend and fellow Darkcast Network host Brenda from Horrifying History. So without further ado, please take a listen to a show and a host I adore. Here's Brenda of Horrifying History with her spooky case. Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com Tizo stands for titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. In other words, their commitment to mineral sun protection is right in the name. Tizo is known for having a unique line of all mineral sunscreens with different textures and finishes that cater to every skin type and tone. Sunscreen application may seem burdensome, but with Tizo, it doesn't have to be. Their sunscreens have been meticulously crafted to seamlessly fit into your daily routine. Whether it is saving a step in the morning with an SPF that doubles as a makeup primer or giving your skin a glow before running errands, Tizo has you covered. All Tizo sun protection formulas have broad spectrum protection and are 100% free of chemical sunscreens, dyes, parabens, gluten, preservatives, fragrances, and phthalates. Check out Tizo's mineral sunscreens and so much more at TizoSkin.com. That's T-I-Z-O Skin.com. Shop with code LISTEN10 to receive 10% off your first order. 
Looking for a new show to dive into? Well, go to Hulu and see what's new. Because Hulu has new stuff all the time. Like the full season of FX's epic limited series Shogun. FX's new international spy thriller The Veil starring Emmy and Golden Globe winner Elizabeth Moss. And don't miss the all-new crime series Under the Bridge, inspired by shocking true events and starring Riley Keough and Lily Gladstone. It's all new, and it's streaming now on Hulu. The Staten Island, New York home that Richard Beechenwald grew up in was not good at all. He was regularly beaten by his father, who was an alcoholic, and very quickly, the side effects of this abuse was seen. At the age of five years old, Richard set fire to his childhood home. Thankfully, there were no injuries, but this resulted in Richard being admitted to the Rockland County Psychiatric Center in Orangeburg, New York, in the United States. Interestingly, this facility was actually a mental health facility for adults, and as we mentioned, Richard was only five. But obviously, his time in the psychiatric center did not help. By the age of eight, Richard was drinking heavily and gambling. By the age of nine, Richard received electroshock therapy at the famous mental health facility in New York City, the Bellevue Hospital. After this, Richard was sent to a state training school for boys. While there, Richard was considered to be a troublemaker and a severe alcoholic. He was accused of theft and inciting other young inmates to escape. On his visits home, he would often steal money from his family and his friends. When Richard turned 11, he attempted to set himself on fire inside his mother's home. At the age of 16, he graduated from the 8th grade and he was released to attend a regular high school. But he only lasted a few weeks, which at that time he dropped out of school. Soon afterwards, Richard went to Nashville, Tennessee for the next two years. He returned back to Staten Island in 1958 after he was arrested in Kentucky. This time, he had upgraded to federal crimes when he stole a car in Nashville and transported it over state lines. He was arrested and sent to prison. After several months had passed, Richard was released but his time in jail did not curb his crime-breaking ways. Soon after his release, the now 18-year-old stole a car on Staten Island and he drove with an accomplice to Bayonne, New Jersey. When there, the men decided to rob a grocery store and in the process they shot and killed Stephen Sedlowski, who was the owner of the store. They ran from the scene and they decided to keep running. Both men were arrested in the U.S. state of Maryland two days later. They were stopped by local police for speeding, and when so, Richard fired a shotgun at state troopers. After being brought back to the state of New Jersey, Richard stood trial for murder. He was convicted and then given a life sentence. In 1975, Richard was released for good behavior after serving only 17 years of his sentence. He started working odd jobs, and he stayed away from the eye of the law. But he caught the eye of someone else a 16-year-old neighborhood girl named Diana Mercelis. The girl was an outstanding student and involved in her community. That's why her parents were shocked when she announced that she was engaged to Richard, who, at this point, was an ex-con who was over twice her age. And Diane's parents had every right to be scared for their child. Two years after Richard was released, he was once again a wanted man. He hadn't checked in with his parole officer since 1977, and he was a suspect in a sexual assault that occurred in the area. Richard was arrested in 1980 on the sexual assault charge, but he was soon released when the victim could not pick him out of a police lineup. But he did end up serving six more years in prison for violating his parole. After his release, Richard and Diane were married. He and his new wife moved into an apartment in Ashbury Park, New Jersey. It was here that Richard met up with one of their neighbors, Darren Fitzgerald. Richard had previously met Darren in jail, and he also was on parole. Problem was that just like Richard, Darren didn't stop committing crimes. At this time, the police were looking for him on charges that included shoplifting and interstate gun running. Soon, people would learn that this friendship was not made in heaven, but in hell. On January 4, 1983, 
The body of 18-year-old Anna Olisowicz was found behind a Burger King by children who were playing in a wooded lot behind the fast food restaurant north of Ashbury Park. She was fully clothed, and there was no signs of sexual assault. She was shot four times in the head and was last seen alive on Labor Day weekend the year before. When this news hit the press, a girlfriend of Diane's quickly called the police with a very strange story. According to this friend, she had accompanied Richard on several trips to the nearby boardwalk for him to look for victims. In addition to this, the friend claimed that Richard had once shown her the body of a young woman that he hid in his garage, and that he actually gave her one of the dead woman's rings as a present. On January 22nd, the police went to Richard's home and surrounded the apartment. They lured Richard out using a ruse, and when he came onto his back porch, he was arrested. Meanwhile, Diane and Darren were still inside. Seeing the commotion outside, Darren decided to hide in a secret room with several weapons. After the police entered the home, they quickly found that secret room. Darren, he refused to open the door, so police threatened to shoot him through the wall. He immediately surrendered. After searching the apartment, police found illegal drugs, pipe bombs, handguns, rifles, shotguns, a machine gun, two different knockout drugs, a large venomous snake, venom collecting tools, and floor plans for several well-known residences and businesses. Now, at this point of our story, I have one question. With all of that bad stuff that was found in the apartment, why the venomous snake and the venom collecting tools? Sorry for the pun here, but isn't that overkill? What were they planning to do with all of that stuff that was found? Well, after the police told Darren what they found and that they heard about that dead woman in the garage, he did what most people would do in his situation. He sung like a canary. He said that Richard had killed Anna. He found the young woman on his trip to a local boardwalk while looking for his next victim. He lured her to his car and shot her four times in the head. Richard then dumped her body behind the Burger King, where she would be found five months later. And then Darren, he just kept talking. He told the police that Richard had also shown him a corpse in his garage and claimed that the woman was killed for business reasons. But this person wasn't Anna. This was another woman that Darren helped bury at Richard's mother's home. While digging this person's grave, Darren accidentally uncovered a second dead woman that Richard had placed there earlier. The police rushed to Richard's mother's home. It was here that they discovered the body of Maria Ciaella. On Halloween in 1981, Maria told her father that she was going to go out about 6 p.m. and would return home by midnight. She never came home. She likely expected to run into some ghosts and goblins that night, but never expected to run into a real monster. Richard, he had shot her that night. He dismembered her body and buried her at his mother's home. But as Darren said, there was another body lying with Maria. Her name was Deborah Osborne, and she was 17 years old when she was killed. She disappeared from a Point Pleasant, New Jersey bar on April 8, 1982. Richard had stabbed her to death and buried her body on top of Deborah's at his mother's home. But that's not the only bodies that police found, because Darren just kept talking. Darren brought them to the remains of 17-year-old Betsy Bacon. Betsy disappeared on November 20, 1982. Richard had shot her twice in the head at the Northern Ashbury Park area before he disposed of her body. Meanwhile, when all this was happening, Richard was charged with murdering a man that he knew. William Ward had escaped prison, and after running into Richard, he was shot five times in the head. Richard buried his body just outside Neptune City in the state of New Jersey. But there were two more murders that the police suspected that Richard committed, but he wasn't charged with. The first was a man named John Petrone. He was a police informant, and he was shot in June of 1978 at an abandoned airport in Fleming, New Jersey. His body was later found buried on a remote New Jersey wildlife preserve. Now the second was a 17-year-old girl named Virginia Clayton. Virginia was abducted and then murdered on September 8, 1982. Her body was discovered three days later, only four miles or about six and a half kilometers away from where John's body was found. Richard went to trial and Darren was the prosecution's star witness. 
he turned state's evidence and he pled guilty on counts of weapons possession and hindering Richard's arrest when he helped dispose of Richard's victims' bodies. Darren received a sentence of five years in prison for each count. Richard, on the other hand, was sentenced to death by lethal injection for the murder of Anna. He then received a life sentence for the murder of William. This is when the appeals began, and it resulted in Richard's death sentence being overturned. At retrial, a new jury sentenced him to death again, and during their next appeal, this case made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where his sentence was overturned again. Richard spent the rest of his life behind bars at the New Jersey State Prison. He died at the age of 67 on March 10, 2008, of natural causes. Thank you all for joining us for our Halloween crossover episode. I wanted to say thank you to CJ from the podcast Beyond the Rainbow for all of their hard work on this episode. You can find Beyond the Rainbow wherever you listen to your favorite shows. You also can find us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram at Horrifying underscore History, on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1, or reach out to us by email at HorrifyingHistory at Outlook.com. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for this podcast. For when you do, not only do you let other people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Strange World of Morning Dolls. If you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you really need to check out our store. You'll find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of amazing perks like ad-free episodes, free merch, additional content, and much, much more, we are now on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifying history to sign up today. Thank you all for listening. And until next time...